This episode is brought to you by Compelled Podcast. I'm its host, Paul Hastings, and we use gripping, immersive storytelling to celebrate the powerful ways God is transforming the lives of missionaries, addicts, prisoners, and other Christians who have unique and compelling testimonies. Listen to Compelled now on your podcast app or by visiting compelledpodcast.com. Hey, everyone. Before we get started, let me remind you that Truce is listener-supported. I'm working hard to do this show full-time, which would mean bigger, better episodes for you and a healthier work-life balance for me. You can help out at trucepodcast.com slash donate or on Venmo at at trucepodcast. The links are in your show notes. Nobody else is covering these huge topics in a sensible, researched, and high-quality way. So help me make more truce. Trucepodcast.com slash donate. Okay, here's the show. This episode is part of a long series about the rise of Christian fundamentalism in the United States up through the Scopes Monkey Trial and the life of William Jennings Bryan. It can stand on its own, but when you're done, go back and enjoy the rest of Season 5 for some context. Also, a warning about this episode. It has a true crime element that involves a brief description of murder, though it won't be graphic. This song probably sounds familiar to you, maybe from the film 2001 A Space Odyssey. Elvis sometimes came out on stage to it. My dad bought new speakers when we were kids, and this is the song he blasted to test them out. It's something you hear at fireworks displays. It's epic, powerful, triumphant. But if you're like me until recently, you probably didn't know that this song has a deeper meaning. The song is called, Forgive My Bad German, also Sprach Zarathustra, or Thus Spoke Zarathustra. The song was composed by a German named Richard Strauss, who started work on it in 1896. The full hour-long composition tells a story by the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who wrote a book by the same name. Thus spoke Zarathustra. Nietzsche is the guy who coined the phrase, God is dead. Honestly, I consider skipping this bit because I don't recommend his work at all. But it's difficult to avoid talking about him when discussing the early days of Christian fundamentalism and the Scopes Monkey Trial. So here goes nothing. Nietzsche, in another famous work, The Gay Science, set out this concern. With the advent of the Enlightenment, scientific advances, and changing morals, humanity was about to go adrift. Society would lose its cultural dependence on Christianity and the Church, thus the idea that we killed God. This is not something he celebrated, though he really didn't like Christianity. Instead, Nietzsche worried that this would create a giant vacuum that had to be filled with something. Without the morality and guidance of religion, we would become obsessed with pleasure and leisure and lose our way. If you stop the conversation here, he's got a lot in common with fundamentalists, right? Well, Nietzsche had a different solution than the fundamentalists did. Totally different. He poses it in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. This song represents a sunrise, like it did in 2001 A Space Odyssey. It rises with this guy, Zarathustra, who considers himself a prophet, basking in the light. He thinks he's wise and runs down the mountain to a town where he shares his ideas. Zarathustra says humanity is basically a bridge between an old species and a new one, like a tightrope across a chasm. According to him, the only way to bridge that evolutionary gap is by ditching the morals of Christianity, like sexual purity and humility, and bettering ourselves through striving and dangerous living. Lust and power, in his mind, are not necessarily bad things. Nietzsche wrote this in a different book. The church fights passion with excision in every sense. Its practice, its cure, is 
is castratism. That's worded in a confusing way. He means to say that the church wants to castrate people's urges. Charming guy, this Nietzsche. It never asks how can one spiritualize, beautify, deify a craving. It has at all times laid the stress of discipline on extirpation of sensuality, of pride, of the lust to rule, of avarice, of vengefulness. But an attack on the roots of passion means an attack on the roots of life. The practice of the church is hostile to life. Yeah, Nietzsche wasn't a fan of Christianity with its rules about human urges. Or, for that matter, humility and service, bowing before God. Instead, we should live dangerously and strive for self-transformation. And by doing so, we could leap to the next stage of evolution, what he called the Ubermensch, or Superman. According to him, our greatest goal was to evolve. The most careful ask today, how is man preserved? But Zarathustra asks, as the only and first one, how is man surpassed? Superman is my care. With me, he and not man is the first and only thing. Not the neighbor, not the poorest one, not the greatest sufferer, nor the best one. Oh, my brethren, what I can love in man is that he has a transition and a destruction. Nietzsche didn't want Jesus, but Napoleon, a strong leader, a legislator, and someone who could control people didn't care for religion, but could actually cow an organization as strong as the Catholic Church, become a bridge between the old world and the new one. Nietzsche was not mentally well. How he died is still up for debate. It was likely either neurosyphilis or acute frontotemporal dementia, either of which may have accounted for his ideas. But these concepts live on. Now, this all probably sounds ethereal, far-fetched, as a lot of philosophy often is. What if someone got in their minds that they were the Superman? A superior evolution, someone smarter, stronger, braver than the rest of the rabble. An atheist who skirted traditional morality above the law. Could they commit a crime so heinous as to draw the attention of the entire nation and get away with it because they were superior? Two men decided to try. You're listening to the show that uses journalistic tools to look inside the Christian church. We press pause in the culture wars in order to explore how we got here and how we can do better. I'm Chris Starin, and this is Truth. Yeah, if you say something you wish you hadn't said, I can go back and cut that piece out because you're not on trial here, Leopold and Lobar. So, uh, <laughs> thank goodness, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to explore this crime and the Superman, I had the great pleasure of talking with Candace Fleming. She's the author of so many books. My most recent book is Murder Among Friends: How Leopold and Loeb Tried to Commit the Perfect Murder. Last year, I had The Rise and Fall of Charles Lindbergh. The year before that, The Family Romanoff, among others. So you've had a bunch of pretty heavy topics after uh, writing children's books. And I have, yes, I have. So I started out with, with children's books, and I've moved on to young adult topics. Which surprised me because her book about this murder gets into some dark stuff. But I checked into it, and it is in the young adult section of my local library. Anyhow... Our story today concerns two young men, Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb, and one of the most famous trials of the 20th century. They both had very difficult childhoods, despite the fact that they were both unbelievably, they came from families that were unbelievably rich and unbelievably privileged and prominent families in Chicago, particularly Richard Loeb's father, who was the vice president of Sears Roebuck, which, you know, Chicago was a huge industry in Chicago. So these were boys that had everything, money, education, privilege, prominence, families that are recognizable. In today's money, the families would be worth a combined $245 million. The boys wanted for nothing in the material sense. 
But that came with unique stresses. Both of them had terrible governesses. Nathan Leopold had a governess who sexually abused him and his older brother. Richard had a governess that was demanding, insistent that he study all the time. Their parents, as was the fashion of the era with rich people, were largely absent. Richard, according to the record, he was more average, and yet he had a governess that pushed him and pushed him. Studying all the time, he wasn't allowed to play like other boys. He worked so hard, in fact, that he graduated high school at 15. He was handsome, smooth, good with women. Nathan was quieter, nowhere near as good looking. The most intelligent of the two, but without the confidence. He graduated high school early as well, and later became the youngest graduate of the University of Michigan at 17. At various times, they attended the University of Chicago, the American home of modernist theology funded by the Rockefellers. Both were younger than their classmates, which must have made it difficult to fit in, feel normal, especially for Nathan. He had interests that were surprising for, for example, as a six-year-old, he discovered that he loved birding and went about not only birding and keeping track of his life list, you know, what he saw, but he actually managed to convince his father to buy him a little rifle so that he could shoot those birds and sort of collect them for himself. He would send them to a taxidermist and then he collected, oh, by the time he went to jail, I think he had 2,000 specimens in his bedroom. Those birds often took him into the woods, including Wolf Lake, where he and others led tours. Richard and Nathan were an odd match as friends, one handsome and outgoing, the other shy and awkward. But they found each other. History hasn't really explained exactly where they met. The record, you can't find it. We think they met at a party where friends, mutual friends of theirs from school, introduced them. Uh, it's interesting that they had not met before, considering that they attended similar schools and lived in the neighborhood together, blocks from each other. And so it's surprising that they had so very much in common. They were both Jewish, and yet they had never met each other until that introduction. And it was, of course, a cataclysmic meeting. They were Jewish at the time of peak anti-Semitism in the United States, though neither of them believed in God and rarely went to synagogue. Nathan's atheism would later play a large role in media depictions of their crime. Nathan Leopold would tell you that Richard was the best buddy he ever had, and he will tell you that all the way to the day he died, that, that he knows Richard ruined his life, but he was still the best friend he'd ever had. The two of them together brought out the very worst characteristics in both of them. Experts tell me, psychiatrists that I interviewed tell me that Nathan probably would not have committed this crime had it not been for Richard. Richard loved true crime. He loved reading crime magazines. He loved reading about master criminals and detectives. And he used to play that he was a master criminal. So even as a teenager, he would do this thing called shadowing, where he would walk around town pretending that he was the master criminal. And he would walk around and he would actually follow people that he saw on the street, and he would imagine that they were bank robbers or embezzlers or murderers and that he was following them. And he would be so deep in his fantasies that he even forget where he was at. So he'd cross in front of cars and, and he would do this for hours. So he really envisioned himself as a criminal. It excited him. But what good is a master criminal without an audience? Richard took Nathan along on his escapades. What started out sort of as petty crimes, right? They would come upon, oh, a couple that were making out in a car parking and they would bang on the windows or they would take a bat, Richard would, and break a car window. By the age of 15, they were starting fires, joyriding, drinking alcohol during Prohibition. They broke into Richard's old fraternity and stole from them. They engaged in bigger and bigger crimes. And of course, ultimately what they ended up doing was deciding that the ultimate thrill at least for Richard, the ultimate thrill was to kidnap and kill the child. The boys thought they were special creatures, evolved, smarter than others, undetectable with their plans and cunning. 
Richard believed that his interest in crime novels prepared him to get away with his deviousness. Nathan took his philosophy from something a little weightier, Friedrich Nietzsche. He adapted this idea of Nietzsche's idea of the Superman, that he was an exceptional human being, exceptional in terms of intellect, superior. And this superiority placed him above the law, it placed him above morality, and that he, because of his superiority, could really be allowed to do anything that he wanted to do. And his Superman status made him untouchable. And of course, then when he met Richard, he convinced Richard that he too was a Superman. So the two of them really believed that they were extraordinary, superior, untouchable, above the law, above morality. In other words, Superman. I'll continue the story after these messages. This episode is brought to you by Compelled Podcast. I'm its host, Paul Hastings, and we use gripping, immersive storytelling to celebrate the powerful ways God is transforming Christians around the world. This season, listen to Catherine, who at age 15 was sentenced to eight years in prison for grand theft auto, larceny, arson, and more. But when she escaped state custody and started hitchhiking across the nation, she was picked up by a country pastor who would share a message with her that would transform her life. Jim was deployed to the Middle East as part of a Navy SEAL team in 2005. Partway during their deployment, his team suffered devastating losses in the mountains of Afghanistan. As Jim grappled with crippling grief, he clung to the one who offered any glimmer of hope. Hormoz once shouted death to America in the streets of Tehran. But after doubts crept into his heart about Islam and his wife found the Lord, he was forced to reckon with what he really believed. Listen to these stories and more by searching for Compelled on your favorite podcast app or by visiting compelledpodcast.com. Leopold and Loeb planned the crime for three months, laying out intricate details, walking the course, timing various elements. They chose Wednesday, May 21st, 1924, for the murder. That day, Nathan went to class at the University of Chicago, where he was studying to be a lawyer. They drove around into their neighborhood of Kenwood, which is uh, at the time was a very exclusive, expensive neighborhood in Chicago. They drove around to the neighborhood in a car that they had rented under a false name, and they looked for an easy mark, so to speak, an easy kid to kidnap, a boy. They didn't have a particular victim in mind, but wanted a rich kid, someone whose parents had the money to pay the hefty ransom. It would be easy to find one in their own affluent neighborhood. They've spent a couple hours looking for a kid to kidnap, and they had not believed it would be this difficult to kidnap a child. And they spend a couple hours looking, and they're just about to give up. And Richard is beside himself. He really wanted to do this crime. And so he begs Nathan to take one more ride around the block. And that's when they see Bobby Franks walking home by himself after baseball practice. He'd been an umpire. Richard knew Bobby. They lived across the street from each other. They were cousins, and Bobby had played on his tennis court only one day before. And so he's easily gotten into the car. Richard says, I want to talk to you about that new racket that you had used the other day. Bobby gets into the car. They drive away. According to their confessions, they hit him in the head with a chisel. And that's how they eventually killed him. Then they headed for Wolf Lake, the place where Nathan liked to take people on birding trips. Together, they shoved Bobby inside of a drainage pipe. Took his clothes drove away, cleaned up the car, burned what clothes that they they could, buried what clothes they could not, and thought they had, you know, it was the perfect crime. When, in fact, it was the exact opposite. The body was found the next morning. The young men didn't know this, and so they continued to follow their plan. A typed ransom note was delivered to Bobby's family instructing them to take a convoluted journey where eventually they'd be expected to throw a bag with $10,000 in it out of a moving train. But Bobby's family never followed the instructions. The boy's body had already been discovered and turned over to police that morning, invalidating the need to pay a ransom. Leopold and Loeb had done a terrible job of hiding the victim, 
and the timing meant they'd never see the money. For two men convinced that they were superior beings, it was just one in a long list of obvious mistakes. One of the ones that really sticks out to me is that they didn't seem to have an alibi until after the crime. They, well, they never seemed to think that they would ever need an alibi. And part of this might feed into that whole Superman idea, too, that they really seriously thought they were so superior, that the Chicago police were so bungling and below them that they would never, ever get caught. And so they never planned an alibi for the actual evening that they were out kidnapping and killing Bobby Franks. They also didn't have a particular victim in mind, committed the crimes in their own neighborhood where they'd be likelier suspects. They even spoke with people they knew that day, not far from the place where Bobby had been taken. When they dump Bobby's body at Wolf Lake, Nathan drops a pair of glasses that he never wore at the scene, right there by the body. So they're picked up the very same day that the body is found. So we have this pair of glasses. And to make it even worse, there's only three pairs of those glasses that have been sold in the Chicago land. Doesn't take police very long to trace those glasses back to Nathan. And the culvert where they stashed the body is someplace Nathan was known to frequent, not far from a road. So they, you know, they're picking places that they're known to go, they're known to live. They leave evidence. They type the ransom note on a typewriter. They actually stole from the fraternity at the University of Michigan. It had faulty keys so that some letters were printed darker than others. During the investigation, the fraternity handed over some of the study notes that Nathan had typed on the machine. They matched the ransom note exactly. At the time, the Chicago Police Department was known for its corruption. This was during Prohibition, when law enforcement was often on the take from the mob. Jobs were given out to friends or for bribes, and there wasn't much training. Yet, it only took them eight days to solve the crime. It's no surprise. Richard actually helped in the investigation. He actually knows a couple of guys that are reporters. They're students, at the, or were students at the university with him. And he knows them, and he actually makes suggestions about where the kidnappers might have called from, what drugstore. And he actually suggests to these reporters that they should all go together. Richard will go with, and they'll check out various drugstores that the kidnappers must have called from. He actually helped reporters put together clues about a crime he committed. When the boys were taken in for questioning, they were not yet suspected as the murderers. Instead, the police brought them in for background. Then, Leopold and Loeb got their stories crossed. I mean, they have this, this alibi, which is, which is a really stupid alibi, and they agree to only use it for a certain amount of time. They came up with it after the crime, once they realized that they could be questioned. Essentially, that they were out carousing the day of the murder driving Nathan's car, and picking up women. The trouble is that Nathan's chauffeur was fixing the brakes on the same day of the murder. Leopold and Loeb had used a rental for the crime. The chauffeur went to the police to prove their innocence, unwittingly contradicting their alibi. Suddenly, the boys were under suspicion. So the minute that the prosecutors say, the chauffeur tells us that he saw you at such and such a time, They both crumble, and they probably could have not, and probably they might have gotten away with it. But instead, they completely crumble, and they both confess. Richard confesses first. Prosecutors go to Nathan and say Richard is confessing. Nathan can't believe it at first until they tell him some of the things that Richard is saying. And one of the things, of course, that Richard is saying is he's blaming it all on Nathan. And that's when Nathan decides that he's going to talk too, and he'll tell them the truth. And he, of course, blames it all on Richard. Nathan knew his rights. He was studying to be a lawyer, yet they didn't seek counsel. In fact, the two men were so proud of their plans that they took investigators on a field trip through the crime location by location, where they burned the clothes, where they hid the body, completely incriminating themselves. There was no doubt they'd done it. All of that stuff happened before the family hired a lawyer. It looked like there was nothing in their future but the hangman's noose, the preferred method of capital punishment in 1924. 
when they did seek out representation, the boy's parents brought in the big guns, Clarence Darrow. Darrow is this unbelievably well-known defense attorney. Not as well-known as he'll later become because this, we haven't had the Scopes trial yet. This That will happen a year later, a year after this trial. But Darrow is an unbelievably well-known defense attorney, and he's gotten other people off of murder sentencing, you know, found them not guilty. So he's mostly known at this time for working with people who do not have access to legal care. He likes the, the poor and the downtrodden, and he often does things pro bono. He would find his office full of folks that needed to talk to an attorney, and he would work with them late into the night, you know, while his dinner is turning cold at home, to help these folks that were no way able to pay what he was worth, but he felt that the justice system didn't work really well for those that did not have money, and so he tried to right that wrong whenever possible. He did, however, take some high-profile cases, and he did take money from very wealthy clients. It was one of the ways that he actually stayed in business. And so the family comes to Darrow because he's had so much success at getting people off of murder charges. He didn't want to do it at first. The case was open and shut. If Darrow was going to serve his clients, he had to change their image in the press. That involved referring to them as boys and by their childhood nicknames, Babe and Dickie. Boys that were unloved. Or he actually uses the, the affluenza defense, right? That because they had so much, they had so little that they didn't really learn what was right from wrong. They didn't really understand what was important, that they'd had these terrible childhoods with the governesses. Darrow's goal was to prove to the court that the sexual and mental abuse that they faced as children impacted their actions and should be taken into consideration. Also, that their exposure to Nietzsche before they were mature enough to interpret it played a role. At the time, mental health was seen by many as the result of genetics. This was the era of eugenics, after all. Darrow wanted to prove that a person's upbringing could impact their mental stability, downplay nature, and emphasize nurture. He wanted parents across the country to look at their own children and ask themselves, am I raising a Nathan Leopold or a Richard Loeb? Am I being a good enough parent? Do, is there anything that I can do to keep my son or daughter from being like those two boys? And he does a pretty good job of it. Darrow's hatred for capital punishment stemmed from his belief that people are driven by impulses from their childhood, things that happen to us way before we have any control over the world. New discoveries in the study of glands linked hormones to changes in mood and behavior. How, then, can you blame someone for their actions if they were predetermined in their youth or by their chemistry? He doesn't go for insanity because if he went for insanity, he would have had to have actually had a trial. And he would have had to prove to a jury that both of those boys were insane. And at the time, the legal defense for insanity was very narrow. So for them to be proven insane, he would have had to proved to a jury that they did not know what they were doing at the time. And that would have been pretty impossible considering all the premeditation that went into the crime. I mean, three months of planning, renting a car, opening up a bank account under assumed names, all of that is not insanity, right? And so Darrow knew that he couldn't really get them off with an insanity plea. And so instead, what he did was he had them actually plead guilty. And then it went right, the trial went right to a sentencing phase instead of an actual trial. So it went right to the sentencing. And that meant there was no jury, that there was just a judge. And the judge would decide what their punishment was. This move confounded the state's attorney, Robert Crow. He and his team spent a lot of time and money gathering evidence for the case tweaking public opinion. He expected the family to go for an insanity plea, which, by state law, required trial by jury. But Darrow went the other way, admitted that the boys were guilty. I mean, it would be impossible to prove otherwise. With a guilty plea, he only had to convince the judge not to kill the young men. He hoped their mental health would be considered a mitigating circumstance, and the judge would take pity on them. And it is a complete and total surprise when 
they go into the courtroom and they change their plea. And the prosecution, I mean, they're apoplectic, right? They're just, I mean, Crow's just like lost his mind. And he has this case that he really wants to lay out. And so weirdly, this sentencing portion of the trial goes on almost the entire summer, mostly because Bob Crow wants to lay out his trial. He really wants to show the press and the public, how premeditated and how evil these two young killers are. He lays it out. He has all of his witnesses come and they all talk. And Darrow says practically nothing, right? This lets it go because he's not trying to find them not guilty. And so he lets all those facts into the record, lets it all go. And then finally, when it's his turn, then introduces evidence about mitigating circumstances and diminished capacity. He said that a person should be able to plead guilty, but also have mitigating circumstances like their mental health included in the sentencing. Their difficult childhoods with the sexual abuse and oppressive governesses should be considered. They were like too old for their age. They were too precocious, exposed to Nietzsche before they were ready to understand it, that they had too much, that they were like the poor little rich boys. This, of course, got a mixed reaction. Newspapers printed stories about other young men convicted of murder who couldn't afford fancy lawyers and were hanged. Why should these two, so cold and calculating, get a lighter sentence simply because they came from wealthier families. Ultimately, why Judge Caverly decides not to give them the death penalty is because of their age. In 1924, neither boy was old enough to sign a contract or get married without parental approval, though they were 18 and 19 at the time of the hearing. So the sentence was life in prison. The verdict was handed down on radio, and 5,000 people waited on the streets outside the courthouse to hear it. Public opinion was mixed. Some papers said that they got off because of their wealth. Others said it was a victory against the death penalty. Leopold and Loeb's lives in the Cook County Jail were pretty easy. Their parents had three meals a day delivered from a nearby restaurant. They played baseball. Prison was another story. They were kept apart for long stretches, made to eat the same food as everyone else. And perhaps, more punishingly, public interest in them waned. Eventually, they did end up in the same prison and became friends once again. Years later, Richard was stabbed in the shower by another inmate. He died in prison. Nathan was grief-stricken, believing Richard to be the best friend he ever had. In prison, he learned 12 languages and Braille and taught other inmates Greek, He even trained to be an x-ray technician. Even at the time of his parole, Nathan still believed he was a Superman. He moved to Puerto Rico and, weirdly for a Nietzsche-believing atheist, worked for a Christian hospital as an x-ray tech. He died in 1971. The case shocked the nation. Not just the murder, but the philosophy behind it. The 1920s were a period of illegal booze, loosening mores around sex, and luxury never before seen in the history of humanity. Here were these two young men who partook in all of this sensuality and were fueled by Nietzsche's philosophy, and somehow they avoided the noose even after brutally killing a child. As Nathan said himself, The only wrong I can do is make a mistake, and my happiness is the only thing in life that matters to me. He still believed he was a Superman, a creature further evolved than the rest of humanity, evidence of the power of evolution. This, of course, is an utterly extreme vision of evolution, not something everyone is going to get out of a day in a science classroom. But it was enough to make people like William Jennings Bryan and the fundamentalists wonder, should we expect more of this in the future if kids are brought up under evolution and Nietzsche's philosophy? One year after the Leopold and Loeb trial, there was a case in Tennessee over whether or not to teach evolution in public schools, the Scopes Monkey Trial. On one side was Clarence Darrow, the lawyer who defended Richard and Nathan. On the other was William Jennings Bryan. We'll cover the case in detail soon, but in his closing arguments, which he never got to give, 
William Jennings Bryan directly expressed this link between Nietzsche and human brutality. In his mind, this atheistic evolutionary philosophy was to blame for the murder. And before you say, oh, those fundamentalists, Clarence Darrow, the famous atheist lawyer, made the same connection in his closing arguments of the Leopold and Loeb case. I'll have a link to it in your show notes if you want to read it for yourself. Now, before you email me, that's obviously not to say that all atheists who read philosophy are murderers. I'm just pointing out how Darrow and Brian agreed. In the next few episodes, we'll be exploring different ideas that Christians had about evolution in the 1920s. And before you get out your pitchforks and picket signs, take a second to absorb what we've covered. The 1920s were a time of massive change in society. Labor strikes, economic turmoil, eugenics, prohibition, the rise of communism in Russia, women voting, new fashions, technologies, new ways of thinking about mental health, and nature versus nurture. We humans didn't know where these new philosophies would take us. Was the world coming apart? Even people who believed in evolution were concerned about where this philosophy could take us, what it could do to their children. So when you and I get to the Scopes trial and fundamentalists are fighting the teaching of evolution in schools, keep Leopold and Loeb in your mind. Fundamentalists didn't oppose teaching evolution in a vacuum. This trial was front page news just a few months before the anti-evolution law was introduced in Tennessee. The question of whether or not to allow evolution education in schools in the 1920s wasn't just about the validity of evolution. Did we actually come from apes? Is the fossil record accurate? I mean, there was plenty of that. But it was also about the appropriate age at which to teach children big concepts, like that of Nietzsche. Whether you agree with them or not, there was concern, like real concern, that if we taught kids these ideas too early, they might end up like Leopold and Loeb. Special thanks to Candace Fleming. Her book is Murder Among Friends. She is a delight to talk to. Patrons of the show can get access to a special bonus conversation I had with her about her other interests. You won't be able to guess what she does for fun. It's a hoot. Thanks also to her publisher, Ann Schwartz Books, for helping us get in touch. You can find links to many of my sources in your show notes and on the website at trucepodcast.com. Once you're there, you can learn more about me and the show and find links to my films like Bringing Up Bobby and Between the Walls, both of which are free on Hoopla and YouTube. It's worth noting that some people I've read see Nathan's vision of the Superman as being a corruption of Nietzsche's philosophy. My intention here is not to express all of his ideas, but to demonstrate how his ideas were interpreted. I'm not a philosopher, but I generally disagree with everything I've read of his, just to be fully honest. I actually hesitated to put this in the episode because I didn't want to inspire people to read Nietzsche. I think it's a cruel and unproductive way to think of the world. Christ taught us to value humility and to love others. There's actually a section where Zarathustra expresses his disgust of the love of the neighbor, preaching it as selfish and saying that instead, a person should work towards creating the Superman. In a word, yuck. Special thanks to everyone who helped with this show. This episode took so much work. So much work. I think every episode probably averages up to 30 to 40 hours of labor. If you'd like to help me make more episodes of Truce, consider giving a bit to help out. You can give via Venmo, PayPal, check, or monthly gifts via Patreon. The links are in your show notes and on the website at trucepodcast.com slash donate. Thanks, as always, to my brother, Nick Starin, for being a sounding board, and to all my friends for letting me ramble on about this topic for months. Leave a comment on Apple Podcasts and follow Truce on social media. The version of Also Sprog Zarathustra used in this episode is thanks to the Creative Commons license and was produced by Kevin McLeod. You'll find the link to the license in your show notes and on the website. Special thanks to my friend Paul Hastings of The Compelled Podcast, which you can hear at compelledpodcast.com 
for loaning me his voice. Truce is a production of Truce Media LLC. I'm Chris Steren, and this is Truce.